Let's just welcome up one more time His Excellency, the Vice President, for a few questions. One more time. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Once again, let me thank you very much for taking out of your busy schedule to come. Now, I just have four questions, right? Because in your speech, you answered some. Now, the first came from, I took this question from the public, and it came from a gentleman, Mr. Osage Ediali Abuja. And his question is this. Given the positive impact the recent intervention by the CBN have had on, forex, on the forex mass, ma market in terms of showing up and stabilizing the value of the Naira, there are many industry watchers who feel that the economic hardship occasioned by the Naira's free fall could have been mitigated if the CBN had deployed its current strategy much earlier in the life cycle of the crisis. Well, um, first, let me say that um, there were difficulties with even doing what the CBN is doing at the moment. At the time when the crisis uh, started, uh, what of course happened was that we were losing almost a million barrels of oil every day. So in effect, almost 60% of foreign exchange revenues were lost. So we were at a point where all our revenues and our main source of revenues is oil. So if you are losing 60% of that revenue, obviously what would happen is that you would not have enough dollars. And if you don't have enough dollars, then you, know, you need more Naira to buy the scarce uh, dollars. So that's what happened then. But things have improved relatively, especially this year. You know, and uh, of course, a lot of that has had to do with the relative calm uh, in the Niger Delta and the fact that you know, the people in the Niger Delta also feel the need to engage and also feel the need to resolve some of these issues so that there can be, you know, so we, we can actually experience, you know, uh, growth and we can actually experience some, some peace and the economy can grow, not just Nigerian economy, but everywhere as well. So I think that the major problem is that now we have a little more money than uh, a year ago because our revenues have certainly gone up. Yes, especially foreign exchange. Okay. Um, the second one comes from Mrs. Yetunde Anibaba, and she says there are claims from different quarters that the Nigerian economy is at least gradually crawling out of recession. Now her question is, has anything changed in the fundamentals to warrant this, and what has changed, and how do we intend to sustain it? Yes, I think, I think we're, we're seeing, as I said today, light at the end of the tunnel, and um, I'm not... Uh, in a position to make any kind of predictions, but I want to say that there certainly is light at the end of the tunnel. And what has changed? Well, first, a lot of the macroeconomic type uh, actions that we think are important are being taken. Uh, I spoke earlier about what we're doing in agriculture, what we're trying to do with MSMEs, uh, how we're trying to reduce, uh, reduce dependency on imports, you know, and how we're trying to improve the business environment generally. We think that a combination of all of these macroeconomic factors, when they come together and come into play, things will certainly improve. And of course, foreign exchange revenues are, are a bit better now. You know, relative peace in the Niger Delta has also assured that you know uh, there will be more investments in the oil in, in the in the oil sector. As I had said earlier, a lot of the international oil companies are investing more, and they are more bullish about the Nigerian uh, oil, oil sector and for the simple reason that there's relative peace uh, in, the, in, in the Niger Delta. So a combination of factors you know, is making life easy. And of course, we're also uh, doing a lot in terms of uh, savings. We're very concerned about costs and we're working very hard on costs. And I'm sure you've heard uh, quite a few of what we're trying to do on cost reduction and all that, and trying to generally manage uh, the, uh, the, the situation. So we think that with prudent management, with the kinds of macroeconomic policies, with aligning our fiscal and, 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 um, and monetary policies properly, and of course with steady revenues, steady foreign exchange revenues, of course another issue of course is generally 
other sources of revenue. And we're trying to work hard on that. For example, tax revenues. You know, our tax revenues are abysmally low. You know, people have suggested, why don't you just increase taxes? Why don't you increase VAT from 5%? Our VAT is one of the lowest uh, anywhere in, with comparable countries. And our tax to GDP is probably one of the lowest in the world also. But we think that our problem is really one of collection of taxes. Because we are doing, I think, something in the order of about 12% in terms of collection. So we don't even need to increase taxes immediately. What we need to do is to effectively collect taxes. And we're, we're trying to work with the FIRS on that. So we can, we can, we can collect taxes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This one is on anti-corruption. Yes. And it's a gentleman who lives in the United States, Mr. Kundayo Awe. He says, the present administration's war against corruption is viewed as being one-sided and directed at the opposition. While corruption of those on the side of the administration is perceived to be overlooked, what is the administration doing to sustain its credibility in this regard? Well, I don't agree that... Uh the anti-corruption war is one-sided. I don't agree. I think that what it is, obviously, there was a federal government, a government that was in place for 16 years. And a lot of what you're seeing in terms of prosecution, you know, at least at the federal level, obviously, uh, you know, uh, corrupt activities that took place when there was in place a federal government. And that, and, you know, the same, uh, the, the same political party, was in, was in power for 16 years. So invariably, you are bound to find more uh, persons within that period who may have committed acts that would be subject to some form of, um, to, uh, to, to, to some form of, uh, to some form of trial or the other, some form of sanction or the other. The other point to note is that if you look at the governors of the states, that have, been, that, have been, that have been prosecuted, you'd find that there are several governors who belong to the ruling party who are also being prosecuted. So it's not just uh, a matter of, it, it's not one-sided. And one thing I want to make very clear is that as far as the president is concerned, that's President Buhari, he's absolutely committed to this, to this fight against corruption. And he really cannot see uh, the difference between one or the other. And I think that in fairness to him, because I discussed with him, regularly on these issues. I think it's very, very committed to ensuring that anybody who infringes uh, the, the, the laws of the land, especially with respect to corruption, is dealt with. And, and I believe that that's, that's, that's the way that we're, we're trying to carry on. Of course, you will find situations where people will say, well, you didn't address this issue immediately, or you didn't address that issue. But one thing you can be sure of is that the wheels of justice might grind slowly, but surely, they will, they will get there. They will get there, without a doubt. All right. The last question is this. There is no great economy in the world without a strong educational system. However, defined at its foundation. We know that our educational system is pathetic in terms of quality and sufficiency. As it is, it hardly inspires productive and innovative mentality. Does this government have any strategic program to address the situation whether in the short or long term and if so what does that program look like yes the ed education you know and, and i think uh, the questioner is absolutely right you know that we have a major uh, problem with, uh, with with our educational system and um, the reforms that are required are not just federal reforms because as you know education in in several instances is concurrent in other words states have a major role to play, and the federal government also has a major role to play, just as local governments have a major role to play. So it's not just a matter of defining policy from the federal government, you know, because the states handle their own schools, you know, and are entitled to define policy. But I think one of the critical things that the federal government has tried to do is to recognize what the broad problems are and try and develop policy along those lines. One of the problems is early education and what goes into early education and preschool, reading and writing, reading and writing skills and all that. And I think that that's one area where there's a lot of, uh, where, where, where there's a lot of uh, policy, innovation and development. And we're trying to ensure that we're able to provide the kind of skills and teach children with the kind of skills 
that will enable them not to just be able to read and write, but also critical thinking. It helps them to question things, helps them to think, you know, to think through things and to be a bit more reflective. That is so important in the policies that we're trying to develop on, on, on education, especially preschool education and early education. The other area, and, and it's a whole big topic, but the other area is STEM, what is called STEM, that's science, technology, uh, engineering, and maths, which, which are the very crucial areas that we think need attention today. Because technology is so crucial, and, and you can't run away from technology. So we're, we're trying to improve our investments in the so-called STEM subjects, you know, and trying to ensure that we put in much more because as you know they, we have a knowledge it's a knowledge economy that uh, is defining what's going to happen in the world in the next uh, few years so we think that we have to do a lot more especially in, in terms of education uh, of um, technology and uh, and we're investing more in in the so-called stem subjects yes. all right just, just one more thing please keep coming back to you now people tell me that they feel one of the problems that they have, I mean, people that really like the government, that um, it's communication. They feel there's a lot the government is doing, but that the communication with the general public, this is what they say, that it's not as good as it was during the campaign. Yes. <laughs> this is what they tell me, <laughs> all right? That yeah. during the campaign to get into power, the communication skills were, yeah. Yeah. that's what yeah. they say. Yeah. You're probably right. You know, you're probably right, and I think that, you know, they're probably right. You know, the, the, the other thing, though, is that, you know, when, when, when you're in government, you know, I suppose one of the chief difficulties is that most people are not as, are not as happy with you as when you are campaigning, you know. So, so even when you're communicating, you know, people are not necessarily listening as closely as all of that. So I, I think that you're, you're right that we could do a lot more in terms of getting out our message. There's no question at all. And, and um, a lot has gone into thinking through that. And how can we engage more? How can we engage the public more? How can we answer the questions more? And how can we, you know, generally get uh, a two-way, you know, conversation going with the public? And um, we're working on it. It's, it's, it's work in progress. We hope we'll be able to get there very soon, you know, so that at least we are better at telling uh, the Nigerian public what we're doing. But I agree with you, we could do a lot better. Let's put our hands together for the vice president. Thank you very much.